Welcome back, Rick. How you doing, Dr. Indeglio? Doing well. Slightly distracted by the dogs running behind me. They are all wrestling currently. <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, some of my own uh, creating all kinds of no extra noise for us here this evening. They want to be part of the show. Yes, we'll, we'll see if uh, AI can uh, take the background noise out on post. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be good. AI can do about everything else. So, in fact, we could probably just let let AI take it from here, couldn't we? That'd be, yeah, we'd be done. Yeah, I think we'd probably have to uh, upload some of our voice uh, samples and things like that. But, you know, why not? Maybe for next time we can get that and just, yeah. <laughs> That's a scary thought, just considering how much <laughs> AI can do right now. The more now. I learn about the, the capabilities of AI, the more I think uh, that's not really a joke. That's probably actually quite possible. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, speaking of uh, interesting uh, trends in education, we've got some research to talk about, don't we? We do, Nick. This was uh, coming from, and we, we've been slowly kind of working our way through this, and it, we've been looking at kind of the top 10 research studies. Ed Utopia does kind of a, an article every year where they kind of review the, the 10 most significant research studies from that year. They do it kind of at the end of the year. So we've been looking at the top 10 studies from 2023. And we continue to look at those. And this is an interesting one that we're looking at tonight because it kind of harkens back to a research study from 2021 that, that kind of became a catchphrase in education for quite some time. It's that idea that brains that fire together wire together. So there was some interesting research out of 2021 that talked about how uh, when a teacher was kind of leading a, a computer science course, right? And what they found out was there were neural fing uh, fingerprints that mirrored brain activity in the students and the teachers and experts in the field, that they could kind of see the similarities in those neural uh, fingerprints. And um, let me just read kind of the, some of the quotes from that study. Students who failed to grasp the material exhibited neural signatures that were outliers. They were drifting. But the brain patterns of students who performed well in a later test aligned strongly with the other top performers and with the teacher and the experts, too. So it kind of got to, gets to that idea of kind of synergy in the classroom and how we can kind of, if we, when we have that synergy, when students are connected and part of that forward momentum, that you can actually see that in brain imaging. And so this new, new study that happened in 2023 was using an EEG to really confirm those findings. So th this is kind of what was happening. A high school science teachers taught groups of young adults fitted with electrodes about science topics, difficult, challenging science topics. And they found that the stronger brain synchrony between peers, between the students and teachers, predicted better academic performance on follow-up te tests, both immediately and a full week later. And some of their findings or conclusions there are that these studies underscore the importance of scholarly expertise and direct instruction, but also hint at the downstream power of peer-to-peer -peer and social learning. Uh, so, which, you know, my brain is immediately thinking, um, while this is a brand new study, I'm thinking we've known this for 100 years because this is Lev Vygotsky, right? This idea that we learn from each other, that we mirror each other and we model for each other. And this is how we learn in community. Um, so, yeah, we've known this for a while or we've had theories, at least, that this is how our brains work best. But now we've got some really strong neurological data that's now been reinforced to kind of show us that, yeah, this is happening. This is effective and it should be kind of informing uh, our approaches to education, uh, certainly in the classroom, in the academic classroom. But I think it's relevant for our counselors, too, who often do a lot of classroom guidance, that these findings are just as important for them as they're equipping students with basic kind of interpersonal skills and social emotional skills and career and academic skills in order to be successful in the classroom and beyond. Um, critically important findings, but I think should reinforce and we, we, ought to, we ought to be doubling down somewhat on the ideas of social learning. But of course, as, as with anything, that's easier said than done. So Nick, how about you? What were some of your kind of reactions to this article? Uh, my biggest reaction ties into um, what our, one of our biggest focuses have been, at least um, at our school, uh, over the past two years. And that's been the idea of revisiting the importance of structured teaching. Um, and that is for those who um, are, you know, we're full of, education's full of terms, right? So yeah. this is simply going back to the whole philosophy of I do, we do, you do right the old school yeah. Yeah, right however the part that often gets missed in that um 
part, and this is what we've been trying to reinforce the most uh, last year and going into this year, is we miss the step of we do together. Um, we often go from I do, we do, you do, and we skip we do together. And everything that's in this research supports the power and the importance of the we do together piece, right? So for those brains to all start firing together, and what a lot of this research is, is indicating is that you have the I do, right? So that could be the direct instruction portion of the lesson. The idea mm -hmm. is that we're training everyone's brain to get focused essentially on the same topic. We've activated prior knowledge at that point. Um, now we're all kind of starting to funnel in, right? Then you go to the we do, right? Which is I now have done my direct instruction. Now I'm going to bring the class in to do some with me, right? And then we auto automatically almost always go to the you do, right? Independent work, right? Yeah. The whole idea of the collaboration part. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the students get to start integrating, start generalizing, start bringing some of that knowledge, working with peers directly, right? So you had the teacher direct. Then you had the teacher with the students, but you have to have the students together as well. And that doesn't mean every lesson is you have to have group work and you have to have structured, you know, group work teaching. It's just the notion of, okay, before we get to independently working, if we are forming that classroom dynamic, right, the dynamism, if we're having that, you have to be able to do the learning together as well. So that's mm -hmm. that missing step which is what this research is pointing to, right? Like yeah. literally brainwaves aligning, getting to that point. Um, like you said, though, much easier said than done, right? Um, and the other interesting piece to mention there, and we can, we can uh, talk more about this, I'm very curious as to your, your thoughts on this as well, is that whenever we talk about that structured learning, it doesn't have to always go in that order in the same way in the lesson, you know what I mean? Like from beginning of class to end of class, there's up, there's different ways to structure that um, along the way. So that was my initial hit. I was like, oh my God, this is totally hitting on the importance of pieces of the structure teaching we're skipping to a large degree. Yeah, Nick, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how a, a, an educator might respond to, to the idea, um, thinking that you know, just that, that sentence you said that this is easier said than done, right? The, the challenge that a teacher might respond with something like, okay, I hear what you're saying. Neurologically, it makes sense. But that we, that, that uh, small group instruction or that social learning, as soon as I put kids, uh, middle school kids in groups together, they're distracted and off task. And we, th this isn't working, <laughs> We, maybe that works with other kids in other schools, but that don't work with my kids because they're distracted. They distract each other. So, I mean, I mean what, what's your response to that? How might you respond to that? Uh, that's a tough question. That is a tough question. Before I would give any advice, though, I would think about the pitfalls of giving advice in that situation. <laughs> that would be my that would be my first response for okay. those who listen to our <laughs> our previous piece there. Um, yeah, I, I, how easy is it for us always to say, oh, that sounds great, but that won't work, right? So yeah. as soon as you bring the camp, you've essentially defeated yourself to a large degree there. You have, yeah. you, it's this will, it's a willingness to be open um, and to actually like do some of the work required to figure out how to make it work, right? If we know these are the things that will work, how do we get to that? Um, mm -hmm. And here's the thing, like, Teaching is hard work. It's not easy, right? If it were easy, yeah, AI would be doing it, right? Or yeah, you know, Jake wouldn't need a degree. All these, you know, all of the things, basically. Um, so I think the hard part to answering that, your question there, Rick, is there. There's so many. Are we talking elementary? Are we talking secondary? Are we talking? Is it really just an attitude issue with the teacher, or is it that the teacher doesn't believe that? It's just they're lazy. Or is it that they're so burnt out and frustrated from the 75 things on their plate that they can't even fathom thinking about another thing? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's so many factors that kind of tie into that to make it hard to give a, give a, a strict answer uh, to that particular thought pattern. No, but I love those responses Nick, because I'm just kind of brainstorming in my head. Well, there, yeah, if you've already given up, <laughs> right, if your response to kind of the research is saying, I can't do it, not my kids, this won't work. 
as opposed to, well, let me experiment. I've got a classroom. I've got kids at least, if not every day, a couple times a week. And so maybe, maybe in those small groups, they need more structure, right? Maybe I need to utilize some classroom management strategies, some small group management strategies. Maybe they need less structure. Maybe I'm, I'm overstructuring things. They need, they need a little more kind of a loose kind of environment in order to kind of facilitate good learning. Maybe I need to kind of up my level of passion <laughs> to, to kind of have the buy-in from the students. Maybe I need to kind of work on a rationale for the students to kind of help them understand why this is important or how this is going to benefit from benefit them or, or why it's important to society or who is right. It, that, that maybe there's some additional kind of work on the front end to kind of get student buy-in because if I don't have that, that might be why they're feeling distracted. So yeah, if there's just a, this immediate kind of, no, I'm not even going to try because it's not my kids. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. That's, that, that's, yeah, <laughs> that might be characteristic of something else that's maybe more important than the nature of the kids that we're talking about. Uh, for sure, potentially. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, uh, now that we've been talking about it for a couple of minutes, I had a chance to pull up, um, you know, maybe something I would share um, with those people, because it always helps to give something in terms of, hey, here's some research or here's some stuff that does work. Um, so I'm just going to pop up on the screen here. This, these are the notes and some of the presentation we used when we were introducing structured teaching, um, you know, also known against that, that it's that gradual release responsibility, right? The I do all the way down to the you do uh, with the pieces that we've missed. So just to kind of um, tap through some of it right there. These are some of the uh, books that we kind of referred to when we talk about those things. So obviously, uh, big names here, right? Doug Fisher, Nancy Frey, John Hattie. These are have the the number of uh studies they've done or or worked through in order to then kind of like put this into layman's terms for us to understand along with Lamove and his strategies and teach like a champion there um some of these quotes rick is are what we worked in there and i think they do tie pretty powerfully to uh the idea that all of these brains can fire together and do things together um this one was very impactful for me and i i you know i, I at risk of kind of like reading it to everyone, um, which I'm just going to do anyway. Uh, so recently I ran into a principal I know, and I asked him about his students and how they are changing. Attention spans are shorter and shorter, he noted, especially because most students don't read outside of school anymore unless they have parents who make them. But we're doing our best to adapt our instruction. It was a short conversation, and I ever found out whether he meant we are adapting instruction to respond to the reduced attention of students by giving young people learning tasks that require less focus, or we're adapting our instruction to try to intentionally socialize concentration and improve student attention spans by engaging them in sustained periods of work on a single task. Mm -hmm. Think about the difference there just for a second, right? Are we dumbing it down? Or are we raising expectations, right, to achieve what we know is possible? Um, yeah. here, then we get the relationship building, right? You can't get to you do and build everything we're talking about until you do the relationship building. Part. So, um, you know, all of these, uh, the research and stuff contributes to that. Anyway, now we get to the scaffolding, and this is what we were just talking about. So a structure for instruction that works. So take a look at the triangle, right? I do. That's the focused instruction. We do it. The guided instruction. You do it together, the students doing that collaborative learning piece, finally getting to you do it alone, right? That's the, the model that we want. That's what we're looking for. What do we often see, though? And we're just going to kind of skip ahead to that because there's so much cool stuff here, right? Focused instruction, I do it. And then you just go do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of teachers like this, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, like, yeah, oh, we just expect. I'm going to give you a little direct instruction, then you're going to take it all on your own. Um, and then also this one, <laughs> which is the, this is the worst of all, right? Like, yeah, hmm, yeah, you just figure it out on yourself. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Independent, independent learning. You, you, you know, you've kind of got this. Um, and then again, I do, we do, you do it alone. That's skipping that critical, we do it together piece yeah. as well there. So, and again, a lot of, in this pre particular presentation, we include a lot of ideas of how to scaffold to get to those things and, and different things you can do there to kind of get to that part. So, um, you know, again, maybe, the, maybe what I would look to share, rethinking your question is some of this type of information where you can see the value in putting these things together and doing uh, things that we know that will work. 
Love it, Nick. Love it. Great recommendations. Uh, yeah. I... Uh oh, sorry. I started <laughs> playing that clip, which is such a great clip. Okay. Anyway. You know, Nick, I, I read through this uh, this summary kind of from, from Edutopia, and, and I already read this part, but let me say it again, um, because I kind of balked at this this little piece. Together, these studies underscore the importance of scholarly expertise and direct instruction. That scholarly expertise piece, I, I don't want to negate it or dismiss it as important, because it is important that, that folks have expertise. Bec- that way they can do the the we do together part, right? They can do that good teaching because they're coming from a place of expertise. And hopefully that expertise is connected to passion because there's nothing that's going to engage students more than passion, right? I mean, we know that, uh, that passion is critically important. So we want students to buy in and we want them to work well together in groups. We need to kind of motivate them. And one way to do that certainly is by exhibiting passion. But I, I guess the, the reason why I balk at it is, is that it feels to me almost the way that it's framed as it's a recipe and all you do is put an expert in the room with students and you, you throw them into small groups and they, uh, they do the material. That's all you have to do. We get an expert, throw the kids into small groups and magic will happen. And that's that you just talked through it, talked through with us a great model where that's not what you're doing. You're taking a very deliberate, intentional approach. And it's the, that pedagogy, right? Those teaching strategies are critically important uh, in order to kind of facilitate the kind of environments where those brains will fire together and wire together. So, yeah, the expertise is important, but I think there's been a shift kind of in education to saying, look, just bring in experts from the field and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll teaching is not, it's just somebody who's an expert at something. No, there's, there's, <laughs> there's teaching strategies. There's way to engage students. There's ways to respond to students and work with parents. And th- th- that, that is both skill and art. And so, yeah, I, I kind of push back against that, even though that's potentially more a conservative ideology, I push back against it. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we need people who are, who are trained and expert teachers. Uh, yeah. And who have a passion for a particular field. Yeah, well, you just summed it up perfectly. You know, it, teaching is both a science and an art. So tell me, tell me what career, you know, what what job is more difficult than that? Trying to having to integrate both of those worlds masterfully to keep the attention and help thirty different unique personalities learn mm-hmm. in a forty five minute time span when their attention spans are at what, 15 seconds now, given, you know, the uh, social media world, yeah. so TikTok and everything else. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a lot. It is a lot. You know, Nick, something else you said kind of reminded me of, of, of a common kind of challenge when I teach school counseling internship class and I teach it every week. And uh, there, there's just a, always a common uh, issue that my students will bring to that class and talk about. And, and they're, they're, <laughs> it's every semester or multiple times a semester that it sounds something like this. And it's typically at the elementary or middle school level that, um, that there's a student in, in, in Mrs. Harris's class <laughs> who is so their behavior is so off the wall, right? They're so disruptive that now Mrs. Harris has given up on them and doesn't want anything to do with them and just calls the counselor or the or the principal. She just she can't stand that that understandably so that Mrs. Harris is frustrated, right? That that this is happening in her <laughs> class. And, right. And it's every semester the same thing. And, and and one of my recommendations to students is um if, if, if that student who's kind of on the edges doesn't have a connection, a meaningful connection with Mrs. Harris or Mr. Jones or whomever it is, if we're lacking that, things probably aren't going to get a whole lot better. <laughs> You're going to knock your head against the wall. You'll have this kid in with you every week. You can even sit in there in the classroom with the kiddo and well, let's not expect to make things better. But, but. If we can, if we can facilitate kind of a, that teacher, Mrs. Harris, Mr. Jones, having lunch with that student uh, a couple times, right? Once a week, once every other week, something like that. Maybe even uh, uh, <laughs> um, set that up to do regularly, not something that's earned, but something that's just kind of a regular connection point and allow some rapport to be established, allow some, allow some trust to be established. Uh, in my experience, that is that was a beautiful solution because often what happens is it lightens the teacher because now they're not responsible for thirty. They're they're 
looking at the one, right? And they're having a real conversation and not having to teach at that time either. The, the task is just to get to know and to get along. And that creates a, that ends up creating a bond. And so, again, I was just reminded of that as you were talking. It's all about relationship. It's all about making those uh, those connections with students and then helping helping to set up environments in which students make meaningful and productive uh, connections with each other. Yeah. Easier said than done for sure, but but possible. Possible with intentional effort. Yeah. In intentional effort, right? That that desire to want to succeed or to make a difference for that kid if you can. Um, or to just know that you can close your eyes and sleep well at night knowing that, you know, no stone was left unturned. Yeah. Um, and hey, some days are better than others. You know, we all get tired. So um, it's not going to be 100% of the time for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, great article. Yeah, great article. There was one other piece that, that caught my attention, Nick, and I don't think I read this piece, but l let me read that the last sentence here of the summary. When okay. advanced students are paired with struggling students, assisted by nudges from the teacher, groups of students might eventually converge around an accurate, common understanding of material. So th this, th there's a suggestion kind of attached to these findings that uh, kind of higher kind of level students, kind of helping students kind of who are, who are struggling, kind of helping kind of pull them up. Um, it, I'm curious about your thoughts about that because I, I can, it makes sense to me, but I'm also imagining some resistance against that. So I, I guess, do you have any reactions to that suggestion? Yeah. And you're going to, I mean, I, I'm maybe a little bit old school um, with this philosophy in that, um, look, at, at the high school level, I know that one of the easiest things to do is to level because most of the kids are close to the same uh, uh tempo, ability level pacing, et cetera. So you can kind of like move at a, at a relatively even flow and everybody gets what they need for the most part. Um, however, we know there's a lot of benefits to the heterogeneous grouping. And one of the reasons for that is what you just referenced and talked about. However, I would caution and say what I have seen over the years is that, and I'm going to, um, uh, pardon my generalizing, um, it's not intended. Uh, but for sake of making the, the the point quicker, if you take your lowest students academically and then your highest students, and that's the expectation that the highest are going to help the lowest, that's too big of a gap. You know what I mean? So there okay. has to be some homogeneous grouping within that heterogeneous mix. So you can't take, oftentimes an AP student is not going to be, you know, the best tutor necessarily or help within a class framework like what you're talking about for a student with, uh, you know, learning support needs, let's say. However, if you take on the bell curve, right, and you take the students who are like at the 70th percentile for the most part, and those kids are together somewhat, right, like you have now created a, a, a somewhat leveled class within those 30 students, right, the gap between the highest student and the lowest student is less wide then you have more success with that type of pairing. You know what I mean? Because, okay. and there's, yeah. there's, there's social factors that too, that play in. Um, and, and, you know, from, from a demographic standpoint, um, reasons why, but on the whole, that is what, um, you know, over the years I have found to be the more successful, um, you know, and obviously that looks a lot different in an elementary classroom where for, where purposely, you know, those, those 25 students are, um, you know, very much uh, heterogeneously grouped. Mm -hmm. um, man, that's a tough, you know, elementary, such a tough load. Just teaching elementary, I, my hat goes off every day to those people. It's just, it's unbelievable what they do. Um, but when you start looking like, you know, towards the middle level and high school level, and you see classes that are, um, even when we say they're not leveled, you know, they're kind of leveled, right? Because we have kids in high level math, you know, and if you're not in the high level math, then you're getting tracked essentially because the schedule has to play a certain way. So okay. we're doing it anyway in, in the existing structure. Um, that's just, you know, kind of what I found there. So people always laugh at me when I say um, having a uh, heterogeneously grouped homogeneous class. Okay. <laughs> because they're like, what, that, what does that even mean? I'm like, that's what I mean by that. Basically. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Nick. I never really thought of it that way. But, but I think what you're suggesting is actually easier to pull off because those students are going to be kind of in the same class naturally. 
right? As opposed to taking the super high achievers with the, you know, the ones really, really struggling, they might be in different classes, right? And to get them together to provide that kind of tutoring or mentoring or support, academic support is going to be, a, is going to be tough to pull that off for sure. But if they're already grouped somewhat, and you're just taking kind of high and low within an already kind of homogeneous group. That makes a lot of sense. I think it's a little bit easier to do. Yeah, you would, you would hope so. And at least from, you know, anecdotally and observationally, that's what I've seen over the years. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a huge advocate for for my students to use mentoring programs. And that's a little difference. It's a little different because I'm not necessarily talking about tutoring here, talking about just kind of providing social emotional support. And so the, the research on mentoring programs is really, 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 really strong. And it, it's, it, but here's the fascinating thing about it. And we're a little bit off topic here, but um, the, it's very beneficial for the students being mentored. And I don't know that we need that kind of the same kind of homogeneous groups, high and low there. Um, but, but uh, we can even have different kind of grade levels, right? And so we could have a fifth grader mentoring a second grader, or we can have a, a ninth grader mentoring a, you know, a seventh grade or whatever. And that would be okay for mentoring programs typically. But what we find traditionally in the research is yes, it's helpful for the student being mentored, but the student who gets the biggest benefit from those kind of uh, connections is the student doing the mentoring. <laughs> those are the ones that feed their self-worth and their self-concept and the social, emotional, and identity growth that happens from being in that role, uh, again, research tells us they're actually benefiting from the situation more than the person who we're actually, you know, setting it up to benefit. So I, I think that's good to, to kind of remind our counselors out there who might be working on setting up a mentoring program that be intentional about the students you select. Yes, you want students who are going to be good models, but you also want to select students who who could really use the extra boost because that kind of a scenario is really going to provide that boost for them. It's going to be a, a significant support. And I always say to folks too, look, the research is so strong on mentoring from socio-emotional standpoint, but going into it, you got to know that the scheduling of these things is miserable. <laughs> it's terrible to try to pull it off and pull kids out of different classes, maybe even different grades uh, to spend time together. It's just so different. They often have different lunch periods. So, you know, you're even limited there. It's so very difficult. But what the research tells us is it's worth the difficulty. It's worth the effort and finding the time to, uh, to pair up some kids who could use that additional support. Uh, so it's hard, but it's worth it. Definitely worth it. Definitely. No question for sure. Oh, well, we did a good job covering that one pretty thoroughly, don't you think, Rick? Yeah, Did great article, agrees? great article, and I think some some real good kind of activation steps for folks to consider both uh, both our educators and our counselors as well, and how to kind of uh, yeah put put it into practice and start working towards some of this stuff. So I, I appreciated the your, your thoughts uh, on this one, Nick. Thank you. All right, and uh, everybody, we will uh, be back with our next segment as uh, Benji continues uh, licking my face as well. <laughs> 